hello everyone. It's a pleasure to have you in this room again, as in the old good times with the amateurs and the professionals collaborating in interesting topics. And actually, in these splinters, we are a little bit more free from the program, and we can present things that we could not send uh, with the deadlines for the conference. So you will see here some new data and some perspectives of future observations that are going to happen in the next few days and weeks and months with the James Webb. Uh, so this is our program for today. We are having also uh, this meeting being streamed uh, through the internet uh, for the people that uh, joined, joined us. So we have good of friends uh, watching these uh, presentations from uh, Portugal, like Antonio Cidadá, from Namibia, like Clive Foster, who is online, and many, and, and some other people. Uh, so these are these times and, and 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 times these times are indicative. I try we will try to keep on time because we only work for this uh, for this meeting, and uh, we will try to to show uh, the value of amateur observations in collaborating with the new and fantastic uh, results that the James Webb Space Telescope is able to to provide or give us uh, in, in these modern times. So in order to, to put a little bit of context in the situation of Jupiter now, I asked John Rogers to make a first talk about the um, dynamic atmosphere of uh, Jupiter now that we deserve uh, to put a context to, to the observations that we are going to see later. So. I see it on your screen here. I don't see yes. In front. Which, which one was, is this a splinter talk? Splinter, yeah. That's it, yes. And then I have to go here. Have to share the screen. And just a reminder that uh, uh, we are going to set to, we are making a recording of this session and it will be placed online uh, in YouTube. Uh, but if you want anything, any content to be removed, we can do that because that is not going to be immediate. So if you want to remove any talk or, or a part of a talk, we can do it or remove a complete talk. Uh, so now I give uh, the word to John, who will uh, be talking about the... Uh... Can I see my talk on your screen? Yes, now, this is up here. No, it's so, here. Okay. Um, can, I, can I use the mouse for... You can use oh, oh, this one for presenting. Okay. But, but the laser might... is not going to show uh, that. Okay. okay. Can I can I use anything as a pointer? Uh, Either you, you have a mouse here. Yeah. Yes. No. Okay. Well, anyway, um, thanks very much, Ricardo, and, and it's really nice to be back. And um, so, so you have here a pointer okay. with a mouse. I'll it's not going to be easy, but uh, if 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 necessary. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so um, I'll try to be less than fifteen minutes because I know we want a lot of time for discussion. Um, but this is just to set. Uh, the, the picture of what are interesting phenomena going on on Jupiter at the moment. So um, this is a, a recent map of the planet, and I'm going to be concentrating on three particular areas that are of interest. Um, first of all, the equatorial zone and north equatorial belt. Whoops. No, sorry. I think, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, um, uh, so where it says NEB south, this area, equatorial zone and North Equatorial Belt, then the Great Red Spot, uh, which is always of interest, and then the South Temperate Domain, particularly the, the uh, ongoing revival of segments of the South Temperate Belt. Um, so this is really continuing on from what I was talking about this morning, um, the interesting phenomena in the NEB and the equatorial zone. Well, the equatorial zone, the big story over the last several years has been the intense coloration, uh, a really in strong orange or ochre coloration. It actually started in 2018. And it's the most intense and prolonged coloration since around about 1990. Uh, it faded somewhat, but then it came back again in 2020. Here we're looking at 2020 July to 2022 July. But um, the, the, the news recently is that it has rapidly faded, almost disappeared. Um, as you see, that's 2022 May and July. Um, meanwhile, in the North Equatorial Belt, um, we've had this uh, rapid narrowing and fading of the, north, uh, of the northern part of the belt, um, which uh, went on during 2021. 
Um, I talked about that this morning, and you can see in the middle panel some of the very dark barges in that this latitude and big cyclonic circulations, which have become prominent as the northern part of the NEB faded. Um, so then there was this very dark uh, orangey brown NEB south component, uh, and that's now the, the location of these um, quite prominent uh, little convective outbreaks, which are producing disturbance both on the south edge and to the north. Um, so this just shows uh, in slightly more detail than this morning, the progress of that. Um, there we are in uh, January 2022 when the barge is really dark and the northern part uh, very, uh, very white. Um, by June, uh, most of the barges had really faded. Um, we also saw that during the South Equatorial Belt fade, during the last big cycle of fading revival of the South Equatorial Belt. So here's another parallel uh, in different latitudes of the planet. Um, and then we have all this disturbance going, along, going on about this along the south edge and sending to brown tendrils uh, northwards across the middle of the belt. And Juno Cam, of course, has um, taken images over the belt at each perigeo, uh, including some rather nice inbound ones now. And so this is from one of the recent perigeos highlighting those faded barges and the tendrils of brown material around them. Um, Shinji Mizumoto has been plotting these um, as, as you saw briefly this morning, uh, and you see that the, the original band of uh, outbreaks in the NEB South uh, component um, has become rather broadened, it's persistent, um, but there's a lot of disturbance at other latitudes, uh, other longitudes as well. Uh, and some of that incident is, is showing uh, the, the, the progression from moderate speeds on, on one side around very rapid speeds on the other side, uh, such as I, I commented on also this morning. Uh, as a sign of dynamics that resembles that in the other jet stream on the other side of the equator. Um, on the left, you're seeing the evolution of that last uh, particularly bright outbreak this year, which Juno Cam had great images of at PJ44. So we have nice coverage of that. And continuing on from the sequence I showed of uh, Juno Cam close ups of the um, middle of the North Equatorial Belt, um, this is uh, a, a uh, perigeo earlier this year. So when the North Equatorial Belt was very um, pale, um, the cloud patterns are just very amorphous, small-scale um, traces which, without obvious um, trends or turbulence. Now we see these brown streaks extending across it and uh, in, in, in fact you can see, if you look very closely, you can see them overlapping some of the amorphous um, features underneath or and it was higher actually. Um, so this may be a stage in the partial peaceful revival of the belt. Um, but while the northern NEB is still faded, the southern NEB is disturbed and the middle is now partly darkened by this um, brown material coming from the southern component. But um, if this is a, a revival of the NEB and clearly it is to some extent, um, it, it may be only partial. And it's not like the revivals of other major belts that we see, which involve big scale convective and turbulent activity across most of the width of a belt. So it remains to be seen whether this is a new kind of phenomenon that we haven't observed in modern times, or whether this is just um, a temporary fluctuation of activity, which will revert to quiescence and then perhaps give a, a really spectacular revival in the usual three year cycle in 2023 or, or even later. Okay, Great Red Spot is, is always of great interest to everyone, and here are a number of recent images of it, uh, taken just a day or two apart, actually. Um, the, the most obvious um, thing about it is the dark, uh, dark grey um, uh, hook uh, around its uh, following the left-hand side, uh, which leads into this dark grey-brown south tropical band extending off to the east. These occur every two years or so on average. We don't really know what triggers them, um, but this has been quite an impressive one that started in July. But you can also um, see, or uh, maybe it's too small to see on the screen, um, an example of the red flakes that come off the Great Red Spot. You can see in fact there. Um, these are quite, um, the, 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 these were important a couple of years ago. Um, they've been rather small since. So, um, um, I just pointed out that there are small examples still happening. Um, they don't appear to be obviously connected to the hook or the, or the band phenomenon. 
So um, uh, just to note that there is one. And the, but perhaps the most important thing about the Great Red Spot is its small size. Um, here's a chart by Shinji showing its size over the last few years, starting in 2019 uh, on the left. Um, it has a long-term shrinkage, as, as I think we all know, um, and that is, is somewhat episodic, but progressive. Uh, and superimposed on that, that, there have been some quite uh, brief shrinkages. The one on, on the left there was during the most intense era of red flakes being torn off the Great Red Spot in 2019. But it recovered somewhat, but then it's gone through a couple more episodes of shrinkage for no obvious external reason. And one has clearly happened um, just this year, and it's now only what, 11 and a half degrees long, which is smaller than, it, smaller than it's ever been before. So um, again, we still don't know if it will survive for our lifetimes. Um, that's a script in longitude, but I'll skip over that for now unless anyone really, anyone really wants to see it. Then the South Temperate Domain. Um, this is a region that has been showing in intriguing cycles of activity and uh, appearances of, of disturbed sectors of South Temperate Belt over the last few decades. Um, but in the last year or two, it seems to have shifted into a somewhat different regime of activity. And the, the South Temperate Belt itself, as a dark, prominent belt, has been largely absent, mostly absent for several decades. Um, but now it's really recovering um, over a large sector. And so um, from this point, at about 180 degrees to the left, there is a solid dark belt there with several impressive turbulent segments. Um, the, the main map here is the very recent one, um, just three weeks ago. Um, the one on the top is a year earlier. And so you can see how some of the interesting features there have evolved. Um, and the reviving SD, STB is made out of several segments. One to the left of Oval BA over there, um, we call segment A. Um, that's been growing longer and longer for uh, now a, a year or two since there was uh, an interaction involving it. Um, Probably more interesting for everyone at the moment is one that I now call it STB segment G. That's continuing a historical alphabetical sequence of these things, um, which is what we called Clyde Spot uh, a year or two ago. Um, it was uh, originally a very faint little pale cyclone um, that Ricardo followed in some detail. Then there was a bright uh, convective eruption in it, just a single pulse, um, which was Clyde Spot. And that set off a continuing um, erupt, uh, continuing sort of turbulent focus at that point, which gradually enlarged. Um, and this has continued to enlarge. And so it's now uh, uh, over 40 degrees long, this, this segment here. Um, and um, in between those, there's, there's a, lovely, a lovely cyclonic white oval called White Spot 6, um, which has also uh, persisted um, for, for a year or more now. And Juno Cam, of course, has got some nice pictures of that, particularly at, uh, particularly at the last perigeo, PJ44. Uh, it had actually been avoiding this sector for various reasons for quite a long time. But uh, at PJ44, it got a really nice uh, image, series of images of White Spot 6 um, up there and of uh, segment G derived from um, Five Spot. Um, what have you been avoiding? <laughs> <laughs> I think Juno Cam was avoiding it because it was flying. It was flying over the Great Blue Spot, yes. and then it was flying over. It was also flying over the opposite latitudes of the planet, and this area happened to be in between them all the time. <laughs> you been avoiding. <laughs> um, but as you can see, also in, in the lower image, this is one by Damien Peach just a couple of a week or two ago. Um, Ground-based observers under the best conditions can also resolve quite a lot of these features, including the turbulence in segment G, and also, incidentally, in these FFRs uh, a bit further south. So um, there, there's certainly a great deal going on there. Here you can see, for instance, there is a lot of dark spots streaming out on the STB North jet stream, uh, emerging from this turbulence sector. Um, they are part of the uh, ongoing production of dark, dark material. Um, that is continuing to darken this latitude. So and we remain to, to see what will happen uh, as a result of all this activity. Um, we've never seen anything good happening in quite, in quite this pattern before. Um, I think it's something very exciting for us amateurs to follow. And also um, for, for Juno counter image whenever it has the opportunity and uh, as a basis for understanding what may be seen in images by James Webb or uh, any ground-based observations. 
So thanks very much for listening. Um, I don't know if you want to do questions now or wait until the end. Over to you, Ricardo. Well, first we are going to thank our speaker. <laughs> We have a bunch of questions now. If not, we will try to have some time at the end to discuss things together. Mm -hmm. There are no questions. We're going to show some of the images of James Webb. Yeah. And Arati Antignano will be giving the talk. I'm going to prepare the talk. So Arati Antignano is an assistant professor now at the University of the Basque Country. Uh, she used to be in Leicester University for several years, but now she's, she's back with us. Let me do it this way. And let me project it because otherwise I'm not sure if it is being said. <clears throat> Okay, now it should be okay. Yes. Okay, thank you, Ricardo. Um, and thank you for inviting me to this talk. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk today about the um, Milkan images uh, that we have obtained uh, of Jupiter um, in July, at the end of July last year. So Ricardo Hueso is the co-investigator of these uh, different images that are going to be used or are being used to investigate the dynamics of uh, Jupiter's atmosphere and also the cloud morphology. Um, so the James Webb, you all know that it is one um, great telescope, uh, one of the best telescopes, the best telescope that we have so far. Um, and it is really great to analyze the cloud morphology the dynamics and the winds of Jupiter atmosphere at different levels. And it is allowing us to study this magnitude, the winds and dynamics in altitudes that we've never been able before because we didn't have any observatory um, actually taking images in these wetlands. So this is really exciting. Um, so here is an image that you've probably seen from the different press releases. Uh, and this image here is not actually from um, a science program, but it was taken during the engineering uh, commission time. And it was just taken to make sure that the web could track um, over um, uh, red targets. So just even if it wasn't for science, we got this really, really nice, um, this really, really nice, um, image of Jupiter, where you can see different uh, moons, the rings, uh, the greater spot, of course, or the, the auroras, and also this um, elevated link here on the, on the right. So this um, image here was taken at the end of uh, July 2022, and it will have a posture time of 12, uh, 75 um, seconds. <clears throat> okay. So the thing that happens with uh, Jupiter is that you know it is very bright, right? Um, so that um, it is kind of a problem, but it is not a problem for us with with with, with Milton. And I will explain why. So it is very bright that we can only image uh, Jupiter in some very narrow uh, filters and in um, uh, filters that are part of uh, strong uh, absorption facts, uh, as you can see here, for example. Uh, with the vertical lines, we have different filters uh, that has been used. Um, but one thing that uh, that we can do um, if the uh, so Jupiter doesn't saturate is that we cannot use all the detectors, but we have to read the detectors in different portions. But um, even if the images that we get seems to be um, saturated as some filters, we have an advantage with Newton. And it has, and, 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 and it is that it has multiple readings. So the images are taken in different groups, and this group uh, have um, different exposure times. So we can, even if the ones that are public um, are saturated or have some of parts of the planet saturated, we can go back to each individual group and take each of these groups 
with a, a shorter exposure times and process them so we don't get these saturated regions. So actually, even if they are saturated, it is good. I mean, don't worry, because we can actually fix it. We can just go back to the other groups and process them one by one, or we can use two or three. Uh, it depends on the image and the weapon that we are using. Um, so here's an example of um, Jupiter um, taken with the um, 2.12 um, and 3.23 um, filters. Uh, so this one on the left, um, it is a filter that senses in a very strong uh, methane absorption band. And the things that we're seeing here right are higher in the atmosphere than the ones that we're seeing dark. So the things that we're seeing dark here are probably at the same altitude as the, as the gap level, more or less. But the ones that are brighter, they're higher up in the atmosphere. So we're not sure yet where they are because we need to analyze this. But they are in the tropopause or maybe even higher than that. Um, then we have this other image here on the, on the right. Um, this is um, taken in the hydrogen uh, absorption plan. And we can see the uh, polar regions, the auroras uh, quite nice. And this is really interesting in a sense that um, we don't have many data in that filter with uh, previous telescopes. Um, and it is uh, sensing even higher than we sense the uh, previous one. So in this image here, it's just the same image, but um, process, so you can see uh, better, right? So one thing is that three, uh, three, uh, 23, we are not seeing actually the regular spot. This, it, it, it is not there. Um, in fact, we can also see the, the, the auroras uh, pretty nice. Oops, sorry. <laughs> oh. Okay. Okay, okay. Um, so this image is now taken this, uh, for the early science program of uh, Jupiter system that the PI is um, Inke, Depate, and Thierry Fouché. Um, so here we can actually see this great image that was processed um, using different wavelengths. Uh, the different um, satellites, the rings, the, the southern aurora, aurora, the northern aurora. Uh, we can also also see waves here. Probably you can see it from where you are, but as you come closer, we can see waves around here. Um, the great response is looking amazing. And then we have all this, all this little detail in, in, in different um, regions of the planet. And these are, uh, this is built, I believe, so this is built because I didn't get that, probably the camera there, right? Um, there was built using uh, uh, two different filters and, and, and exposure times. Um, so yeah, so this was taken with the, uh, for the early release science um, <coughs> program. And so here, so just uh, an example of the image taken at 212. Okay, so the thing here is that we have three images taken separated by a few minutes only. So we can actually use this, derotate them, and have a better image. So with a higher signal to noise image. If we do this, we can have this image here on the right. So you can see this is processed to get uh, all the details or small details of the, of the image. Um, as I said before, the writer group is not high enough in the atmosphere. And so here it is the same figure, the same image, sorry, but just in, in larger resolution so you can see everything. Okay, this is part of the, uh, this is the equatorial region. Um, and if I go um, back and forth, where? Back and forth? Anyways, if I go, you know. Okay. There yeah, we go, slow, but it goes, right? So if I do this, if I blink the images, they're separated by one rotation of Jupiter, so it's around 10 hours. And if I do this, we can actually see that these two images 
are just okay are just enough to give us a sense of the motion of the of the different uh, clouds that we see in there. We are seeing storms that seems to be even higher up, or clouds they are even higher that um, that the that that the background. We can see that in ten hours they change the shape or they change uh, in latitude. So just with these two images, we have lots of information. We can detect winds. We can retrieve uh, the dynamics. We can actually study the morphology of all these images. And if I do the same for the northern uh, region of the planet, we actually can see here the waves that I was uh, talking before. And we can see this uh, polar or the higher latitudes. And again, if I go back and forth, okay. <laughs> you can see they're moving again, okay, it's, it's a very slow, but you can see they're moving, you can see how the systems are evolving in some time, and this is separated by one rotation. It will be graded, we can have separated by one hour or two hours, so you can actually um, retrieve even more uh, winds and study how these uh, higher clouds are changing. Um, so this is an example of um, an amateur observer that is Processing also gem through data or NIRPAM data. This is from Martin Glassman. Okay, so Martin is currently working in um, processing the, the images to get um, 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 a good signal to noise radio images with all the D days. So we can obtain even more information from that. So this is actually uh, a, a work that is ongoing. But it's something that also amateur, of, um, amateur uh, observers can, can work on, not only observing, but also but processing uh, images. I do it magic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is the same before 335. In this case, you can see that the image has um, a lower quality. Um, we have also three images, so we can be rotated. Um, once again, what we see in bright is higher up in the atmosphere. We can see the waters, they are saturated. We can see the um, weather spot that is also saturated. But as I said before, this is not a problem because we can go uh, back, have a look at each and of individual um, groups, and, and get images of these wavelengths where the weather spot is not um, saturated. So this is the image, I believe this is the image after the rotating, these three images that are taken, as I said, you can see that it is, it is, um, it is separated by the non-water because we can actually get images without separating. And just to finish, we also have other filters. So this is a filter, that is one um, 74. So we have nine filters like this one. These images can be derotated again to get a higher signal noise radio. Um, these images are a bit more difficult to navigate with the geometry and all this, but once we get this done, um, we can also retrieve again wings and study dynamics and the morphology at other filters that are giving us information at different altitudes. So we actually have here just for example with the image that, the, that, that I showed three different altitudes. There were these three um, filters. Uh, this is the uh, this is not the full array, but this is the sub, uh, 640 for the south wayland, and we have the same one for the long wayland. So in the case of the long wayland, um, here are two examples and two different filters with the exposure times and and. The problem that we found at the beginning with these images is that there are lots of dark pixels. Um, there are these pixels that they dark, that they are bad pixels, but in reality they are not bad pixels, but the pipeline that process the or the calibrate the, the JSWOR data think they're bad. So then the pipeline deletes from the from the uh, images. So Ricardo and also Pablo Ovalle has been working in um, software uh, to remove these uh, bad pixels and actually get the real ones uh, so we can get images without this um, small dark uh, pixels on it. 
Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. I think we have time for just one question now because if we allow many questions, we will not go on to the next month. I'm, I'm a bit confused by which filter is which. There's any names at the bottom in red. What's yeah. the rule for the, the names of the filter? How do you tell? So it has a three point, probably like three point six, and then sort of like nanometers. Microns. Microns. Three point six microns. Yeah. So three point six microns, four point four, one point seven two, two uh, microns. And NMS at the end is whether it's narrow, merit, medium, or wide. Yes. Yeah, no, so the um, yeah, so this is a, a wide filter and the N is narrow right. and the M, I guess, is medium. <laughs> I wouldn't say for the M, but I guess it's medium. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, then. So we to go to, now we are going to continue with the day swipe uh, observations, yeah. but it's going to be a uh, uh, I, I should say that James Webb has observed Jupiter also in the spectroscopy and in the mid infrared uh, with other instruments. So, Henrik Merlin will be talking about uh, the other observations with the James Webb. And also the perspectives to observe the outer planets, because there is a whole lot of uh, different observations of uh, not only Jupiter, but also Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune uh, uh, coming out uh, very, very close in time. So I'm going to share the screen again. And it should be right. Yes. Great. Thank you. So the uh, James Webb sail sketch continues. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to be talking about the spectroscopic data and the programs we're having in place to study the giant planets of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Uranus, and Neptune with the James Webb Space Telescope. I'm going to start by taking you down memory lane. Christmas Day. Uh, I think you need to be closer to the Can use this. Uh, yeah. Hello? this is exactly like all the oh. the rest of the <laughs> I wasn't intending to have sound on this, but it's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah, so, sure. This is Christmas Day, about 20 past 12. And, you know, on Christmas Day, you're allowed to have a drink <laughs> <laughs> about noon to steady the nerves. So it's absolutely extraordinary to see this actually happen for this telescope for actually to take off uh, into space. And about half an hour later, we saw the observatory separate from the launch vehicle. And we're gonna see the first of about 300 deployments that the tel this telescope needed to undertake. Uh, and that's the deployment of the solar panel, which will happen about right now. Now, there we go. <laughs> and so the observatory now has power. So. An extraordinary day uh, that we, a lot of us have been waiting a very long time for. Uh, I should always have a soundtrack to my talk. It's kind of nice, isn't it? <laughs> so, and just to just to take a step back and think about why the James Webb Space Telescope is such an extraordinary facility, that's because it's so sensitive. And why is it sensitive? Well, firstly, it has an enormous mirror. You think about Hubble, this workhorse we've had in astronomy for over three decades, a mirror of uh, two point four meters on the left there. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope mirror dwarfs this significantly. It's a six and a half meter mirror uh, made out of 18 golden segments. So just sheer size means we're collecting a lot more photos. Uh, the second reason is that the James Webb Space Telescope is incredibly cold, uh, which gives you great sensitivity. So here's uh, the way this is implemented. We have this enormous sun shield uh, often compared to the size of a, of a tennis court uh, or so. So we have five layers of aluminium coated cactum, which is sort of a space blanket. On the bottom side, where the sun hits the observatory, it's about 85 degrees Celsius. So it's pretty hot, too hot to the touch. Uh, but on the sun, on the shade side, where the observatory and the instruments live, it's about uh, 40 Kelvin. So these is sort of a passive cooling mechanism, which is extremely efficient at keeping the telescope uh, and the instrument's extremely cold. If you have a cold instrument, uh, you get better signal to noise. 
And also this is an infrared observatory. So we need the spacecraft to be very cold. Anything in the infrared emits light. And so we don't want to be observing the observatory when we observe stuff in the universe. And uh, MIRI is an all, another interesting, uh, cool instrument. Uh, it's, uh, it's got this sort of internal helium cryocooler, which cools it even further. So MIRI is seven kelvins above absolute zero. So it's an extremely cold telescope <laughs> with an extremely cold instrument as well. Um, so yeah, just the technology I found quite fascinating. Here's a uh, summary of the giant planet uh, web observations we have in the pipeline. We're going to observe all the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. We're going to be using a, what's called the integral field unit on the mid-infrared instrument, MIRI, in the mid-infrared, obviously, and an IFU on the near spec, the uh, near infrared uh, spectrograph. Uh, but I'll take you through these uh, in more detail shortly. So what are we trying to do here? Well, these are the first observations of giant planets taken by the James Webb Space Telescope. So it sets the starting point of a sort of a, the baseline of the, all the data we're going to get from now on. So we're hoping, depending on fuel and micromedia, meteorite impacts and stuff like that, but we're hoping for 20 years at least of operation, uh, which is nice. But fuel is thought to be the limiting factor, and that's true. And if you run out of fuel, you might think the mission over, but I've learned a fun fact. There is an exposed fuel cap. So if you build, this spacecraft doesn't exist yet, but if you build a spacecraft to fly out, unscrew this thing and fuel it up, you can actually add more fuel to the spacecraft. So I guess that's all I had. Uh, so we're seeing regions here we've not seen before where it's from the ground. The Earth absorbs a lot of light in the atmosphere, which is hidden to us. So we're exploring new re spectral regions. Uh, because we're using the same instruments for all four planets, we can really enable some serious comparative planet planetology. How are these planets similar? How are they different? Things like that. We're also testing some technical capabilities of the observatory. And Arata mentioned this earlier. We, we're observing, in the case of the Great Red Spot, for example, observing a point on a rotating planet, which is non-sidereal. That tracking issue is very actually very complicated. And these observations are meant to make sure that the observatory can do this, uh, and it can, which is good news, right? Uh, the IFUs we're using are really small, so three by three arc seconds. Uh, Arata's images show full pictures of Jupiter. We're going to have to focus in on very specific points on Jupiter and track, be able to track those and things like that. And because these observations are really hard to come by, <laughs> the really, and the really points in time, the collaboration with this amateur community is really important. It gives us a baseline to put context for, to put these observations in, essentially. We have one day, we have some James Webb observations. We need a broader baseline than that to observe the temporal uh, context. So let's start with uh, Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter, we have, because the IFUs are really small, three by three arc seconds, we can't really target uh, a single observation at any point, or we could. So the Great Red Spot has been the first target. So we have a mosaic of six IFU frames, which covers the Great Red Spot nicely. So that obviously that takes a little time to build up these cubes. The second target is the Southern Pole. So we have captured the Southern Aurora and uh, the, the polar atmosphere at the same point. Jupiter is really challenging because it's bright. So that some of the spectral region are gonna saturate. So beyond, beyond uh, 11 microns or so, we expect Jupiter to be way too bright for this instrument. So it's a shame that it would be an interesting spectral region to have. Same in the near infrared, uh, we're going to see some really bright uh, regions. So we actually have uh, data in hand from the Great Red Spot. And I'm not going to show it here because I don't want to spoil it. So we have Jake Harkett, a student at the University of Leicester, is going to show the first results from the Great Red Spot on Friday morning. And Lee, Lee Fletcher is going to present that. I, Encourage you to see uh, that presentation. It's absolutely stunning and really worthwhile uh, attending. Uh, so as Jupiter, yeah, Saturn, because Saturn is further away, is smaller in the sky, and becomes a little bit easier to map out with these IFUs. So we're going to target firstly the polar atmosphere, gives us a sense of the evolution of the polar hexagon as the polar atmosphere evolve over time. And an important thing here is that the Cassini mission ended in 2017. How has Saturn continued to evolve since then? We have not really had any ice on Saturn uh, until, until now, and hopefully 
we can continue to use James Webb uh, just you know, from 2004 and onwards. That'd be, that'd be cool. So we could look at the rings as well. There is a claim that James Webb be able to detect some moons that Cassini couldn't. Uh, I think that's an interesting claim. Let's see, we'll see what happens. And we'll get pole to pole coverage down to the rings uh, anyway. And I think, so that's awesome. I think the most exciting target for me is Uranus and Neptune. It's almost like these IFUs were made to fit right on top of these planets. So we see this is some uh, synthetic images with IF, approximate IFU size put on Uranus and on Neptune. You can see we fit these perfectly. So these planets are not too bright, they're just the right brightness, just the right size to get a spectra from like two all the way to 28 microns. So we're actually capturing the whole column of atmosphere here to the deep troposphere, up to the stratosphere, and then upper atmosphere and aurora at the same time. And that will enable us to sort of uh, investigate uh, how these different layers are coupled. How does energy move uh, between these layers and within these layers themselves? And from both Neptune and Uranus, we'll get global maps in all these wavelengths from two to 28 microns. This is gonna be absolutely revolutionary. We have never had anything like this before. And that's really exciting. We could, you know, what is nice giant? Really compare these two uh, side by side. I think that's gonna be absolutely gorgeous. Uh, so when are we doing these observations? Well, it's, it's turning out to be a little bit tricky. We get about a month lead time when they tell us we're gonna get these observations and the different windows of visibility for each planet. Uh, uh, so right now, what is it, the 21st? Uh, Neptune, oh, Uranus is visible. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, we were meant to get uh, Uranus observations last week, but as uh, you may have heard, uh, one of the instrument modes that we're particularly interested in using has a little, uh, little snafu, I must say. So this is being investigated, and we're really hoping this will be resolved shortly. Uh, uh, so that's one of the two instruments we're using, but I think probably not to worry too much, it'll get fixed. Right. <laughs> uh, okay, I just want to wrap up. So James Webb is a revolutionary observatory. It will give us access to data that we've never had, had before. I'm going to study all these four giant planets with the exact same instruments, using the exact same settings, which opens up some pretty serious, powerful comparative planetology, which is interesting. Uh, there are some challenges, of course. Jupiter, Jupiter for example, is really bright. Um, it's mostly Jupiter that's a challenge. I guess Saturn's rings have been bright as well. Uh, and this is the, really the, the starting gun for the giant planet science with the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, I find that incredibly exciting. We have a telescope now in space. You couldn't say that last EPC. We have a functioning telescope taking extraordinary data. And Arav has shown some as well. I, I'm going to show a little bit more. You probably saw this. Uh, this is an image taken of Neptune. It was released a few hours ago. Uh, absolutely extraordinary. And this image highlights the real power and sensitivity of the James Webb Space Telescope. Yeah, uh, it's a picture of Neptune. I'll zoom in on that in a second. But in the background, all these galaxies just pop out. You know, you're staring at Neptune, but it's so sensitive. You can't help at picking up all this noise as galaxies. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the, the zoom in on, on Neptune itself. How about that? Again, rings just pop out because it's so sensitive. Anyway, I'm going to leave you with that. <laughs> Thank you. So we can have time for one question. Um, well, what about Saturn imaging? I think I saw it there in your thing the last month. But... Saturn images? Saturn, uh, Saturn with James Webb. Yes, yes. I did, I did have a slide on Saturn, didn't I? Uh, so we're going... Yes, that's Saturn. So we're going to do, take spectroscopic observations. I'm not sure there's any imaging in the pipeline. Uh, I just wondered when that would be. Ah. You, you said you were going to cover these areas. Yes, when? Uh, good question. <laughs> Lee, do you have the? Yeah, it's, um, so there's actually a, a wider program than just Saturn itself. We'll hopefully get the atmosphere in those uh, three frames and then the rings in October. Ah. But then there are some images, but they're designed for detection of small minor bodies in the rings. So we'll be sadly completely saturated on Saturn, but we will hopefully be detecting fine scales, which 
Okay, so don't expect at the moment near cam, well, the same quality as what we're seeing you for. We'll have to propose that as I can see. Worth it. I would say so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you know that we live in the fantastic period of time in which we don't only have a telescope like the James Webb, we also have Juno still working and so we are able to observe Jupiter uh, with uh, the Juno spacecraft and the Juno mission and we have Pia Glenn Norton who is going to give an update about the observations of Jupiter with, uh, with Juno and the status of the mission. This will work or not? I'm, if not, it will be okay. Okay, I'll we'll try to <laughs> see what happens. Thank you. Sorry, I went out. I had a I volunteered for a uh, EPSC mentorship of early career scientists, and they gave me three of them. <laughs> so one of them had a talk downstairs, and I missed the other two. So I found them back. I'll ask. Let's see. All right, you can repeat everything you did. Just <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, not just Juno Cam, but other observations, uh, instruments. Uh, hmm. Yes, yes so I'm here. Yes, it's here. Oh, right. Good. Uh, so, a lot of the in information we're going to get uh, about uh, Jupiter from Juno is going to be on Friday and Thursday. I really commend you just to see those talks because I can't tell you what's <laughs> myself. Uh, but uh, Scott Bolton will talk about the depths of vortices, which are actually quite deep in the atmosphere. Uh, me will give a characterization of cold filamentary regions from a variety of wavelengths. Uh, Sean, sitting here, will give you uh, a dissection of Jupiter's thunderstorms from a variety of instruments at the same time. Uh, I'll talk about the depths of changes in the planet from the microwave radiometer point of view, focusing on many of the areas that John just pointed out have, have changed in the last uh, two years or longer. Uh, and Nick will talk about zonal profiles of aerosols, uh, condensable cysticlobium species from GERAM, which is the near infrared instrument. Uh, uh, Gerald will talk about the long baseline observations, uh, which in involves uh, um, parameterization of cloud heights uh, using uh, different uh, fields of view. Uh, Nimrod Gavion will talk about oscillatory motions of polar cyclones, the circumpolar cyclones. Uh, John will talk about uh, high northern latitude dynamics and see, give us a bit about the south. Uh, and uh, uh, Chara Tsionoli will talk about methane of certain temperatures and the auroral energy. And we'll have more information on shapes and, and interiors and ionospheric magnetosphere satellite results. These are the people who really are going to give you the updates on all of this. Uh, Junocam observations are going to revolve around Perjo 43 and 44. These are, again, these are a series of slides that John probably could have given as, as well <laughs> as I am, because uh, we focus first on Junocam. Uh, it's interesting that not only we have observations that are uh, in this region, here, which are the close-up images, but we realize that coming in now from the outside, we can get the opposite hemisphere, not quite the same resolution, but uh, well, that's going to be very good. Uh, as I pointed out uh, uh, this morning, uh, after a while, about a year from now, that's about all we're getting will be the inbound images. The outbound images in the south may in fact be so um, low in resolution that may be omitted from the long data sequence that we get. Uh, what's interesting is, uh, again, something John alluded to, uh, is that uh, among all of these, I've noticed that you have an NEB self and the NTB self. There's no NEB north or NTB north at all. Uh, you can find that these are, uh, uh, from a point of view of five microns, those are missing in, in that sequence. And make sure I can keep going. Uh, 
at five microns, we notice again, this is one of Tron's favorite things when we're doing observing is note that the entire northern hemisphere is dark at five microns. Uh, here we note from uh, uh, Pardo 43 that we are back in a region where we can get shadows. And that was not really quite true unless you're very far in the northern hemisphere. Uh, but now we can get a bit further south. And John has uh, color graphs and very different things from the usual, very, very narrow uh, pop up clouds that we've seen that look like small popcorn things. These are now, I think, John's color graphs. And uh, we'll see whether they, we have a question about dynamically whether these have a different type of origin or are they just making a different type of uh, climatological effect in the upper atmosphere as they type rising. Again, it's really interesting to note, again, uh, channeling John, there are differences when we put together these maps for uh, populations of, of cases, and this is the southern hemisphere, the south polar region, uh, for different things that we've seen and sort of a negative of one another, which I think means that uh, different, uh, effectively, we see different cases on the inbound uh, coming in and the right kind of side. Uh, uh, dawn and dusk, which means that as you're, you have a very distinct particle size that's taking place as you're, for example, driving or walking into a fog and the sun is on the horizon in front of you, you can't see much because you have a lot of forward scattering from very small particles. Otherwise, in the opposite direction, it's not so big, but you may get larger particles, on the other hand, that are populating what you see when you walk in the other direction. So that's going to be an interesting thing. A challenge here is that the fact this is not a photometric instrument. So we need to make some quantitative state, qualitative statements about where we expect things to be. Again, uh, the type of, we're seeing again, very high resolution uh, observations over a narrow latitude, uh, longitude range. And the sort of material that we see from the inbound, we're still getting outbound uh, data from the Southern hemisphere. Uh, we're not going to see this uh, southbound stuff in the next uh, peridrome, which is a week uh, from today, uh, peridrome 45, uh, as we're saving a lot of data space for images of Europa, uh, in the same way that we save space on uh, Galileo for the probe site. So we'll just be getting the north and the inbound. Oh, no. Uh, we have both from uh, Juno Cam and Jiram Cam, part of 43 and 44 combined to get uh, uh, characterization of certain polar cyclones. And again, if you see closer up, Jiram is doing the same thing. We're looking at uh, continuing to look at the various depths where the bright material, as it has been true, is uh, dark material. Uh, it shows up darker in the Jiram material showing that it's actually high altitude in the colder part of the atmosphere. And again, as Don uh, pointed out, we have uh, observations. And as I said this morning, we saw, we know that we're going to be coming close to these upwelling up graphs that are popping up uh, in a curious way in the uh, southern part of the uh, NEB, and occasionally I'm actually pinging right on top of some of these. It's an interesting phenomenon, and it's very nice that the general camera is seeing a lot of the detail, uh, which will be described for the period of 38 by Sean uh, tomorrow. One of the things we're doing is looking at uh, cloud shadows in order to use them as a measure of differences in cloud altitudes. Uh, we started with some of this work uh, with uh, Tristan Gio, uh, Michael H. Wong, and myself looking at uh, particular features. Uh, for this one, uh, which they call the Nautilus, which is a full of the Pellandry feature far north, which has some shadowing, uh, and look at points in the um, that's not, looks on my hand. It doesn't really work very well. From these areas to the upper side, if you're online, from a central figure that can be seen 
in various streets, primarily these folded, these uh, pop up pop -up bands that appear on the outside of some of these, uh, we can use creating the uh, geometry that we need. It was non trivial. Uh, the generic calculation depends on treating it as possibly as a wall uh, instead of just a single point, which is much easier. And there's a dependence on the incident and the uh, emission angle as well as uh, the azimuth. And so we had to keep this all in mind and find that uh, we have differences in cloud altitudes that are not so different from what we expect in many cases for some of these broad features as uh, difference between an towards H cloud base and an ammonia cloud base in chemical equilibrium theory. More often though, we see uh, smaller uh, areas, again, these patterns of uh, pop-up clouds in a cloud bank, as it were, uh, ranging from 20 to 27, 30 to 40 kilometers. Uh, typically, you see for Jupiter is about 20 uh, kilometers or scale height near the minimum temperature. Um, we're looking now at some work that uh, Caleb Kiveney, uh, Nature in the Summer, had done with us, looking solely at pop up clouds uh, and some of these, what you call puffy, or maybe some of the cloud rafts that, that John might have characterized. I'm looking at some of these. Uh, so he's characterized them as a uh, uh, sort of generic uh, qualitative sense as a linear feature, puffy features, or linear puffy or linear curve feature, uh, which is an interesting way of having someone who doesn't know anything about the planet to look at them. I mean, not that we know a whole lot more about these than, than a novice does. Again, he pointed up uh, some of these features we see are quite identifiable. And the difficulty with anything besides these is in fact that there are so many dark bands around all sides of these that you can't distinguish what's naturally dark from what's a shadow. This is one of the real problems about using this as a technique. So he's continued with a number of these in different places, finding different cloud altitudes. And these are not altitude numbers. I think these are just this characterizations. And so he has a description of many of these embedded in clouds and of the sort of 18, and by 18, he means 18 individual bands, which have many, many measurements among them. So this was hundreds of observations and calculations. So here's a distribution of his cloud heights, which are close to a medium of 13, which is about half a scale height of the atmosphere. So this is not, not a fully developed difference between NH4SH and ammonia. This is something else. For the pop-up clouds, we expect these are all ammonia. Maybe if we could get observations from Jura, we might see these are pristine ammonia uh, uh, condensate features. And by morphology, uh, I don't think there's very much of a change you see with that. And comparison of terrestrial clouds, uh, during the fall below a six kilometer altitude, uh, they're convectively generated. Uh, and we need to look at trends, measurement of pop-up clouds everywhere else, and look at non-pop-up clouds, points casting shadows. Uh, I want to quick mention that the UV instrument detected a sprite, which was an unexpected feature in the atmosphere where we saw um, something that was too high to be lightning, but interpreted as a transient luminous event, the TLE, which is often known as a sprite or an elf uh, seen in the Earth's atmosphere above thunderstorms. It was generated by energetic lightning displays. And I want to do note that one addition to uh, John's uh, measurement that we uh, these are OPAL, uh, the Planet Atmospheric Legacy Programs, cylindrical maps from Hubble. In fact, we've been looking at some of these regions where the equatorial center part of the EC from three south to one north is actually, which is the darkest, in fact, has become much 
right here. And that reflectivity is 2.17 microns, which means that we are first or, or uh, first order interpretation is a high altitude cloud. We began with the easy north starting, but then we're going back. So the question is, well, now that we have a uh, population a description of the uh, region, uh, here's a raw bullet uh, map. This is clearly faded away or almost faded away totally. Will these drop down completely if there is, in fact, some association between the two that has physical chemistry involved with it? And the answer is fleeting. Uh, so, yes. So there's a definite correlation between the chemistry and the altitude of these materials, which is a big deal for me, at least. Now we just need the funding to take out of what's going on with all of this stuff. And that is indeed what we want to do next. Occasionally we get really, really super good seeing. And here's our plot of uh, overall H3 plus observations from the ground. <laughs> That's it. So it looks like we are a little bit out of, out of time, but I think we can stay here, make some questions for the four speakers. There's a two minute epilogue. Sir? Your request for a two minute epilogue. Yeah, no, what? <laughs> <laughs> we are never able to, to, to keep on the the schedules, but uh, we have a few minutes in case to, we want to, to, to discuss something. Unfortunately, I have to remove the computer fairly soon because I have another meeting in another place in mm -hmm. 20 minutes. But uh, any question, especially from the amateur community here, and how they can help us? Because you see that even though we have this fantastic data, where I see relying on you to get the temporal something of the atmosphere of Jupiter, understanding these atmospheric phenomena in the a particular context and also the other outer planets. It's not only Jupiter, Jupiter is the one that is uh, the easiest for the amateur, but it's also Uranus and Neptune, and of course Saturn. And uh, then I have uh, an obvious question. Uh, how can we know about the, the, the planning uh, of accelerations for, for the James Webb telescope? You, you, you show the uh, slides and saying, but one month in advance, you, you would have a discussion. Okay. Yeah, the thing with solar system programs is probably Neptune, for example. But right now, it gives you a very broad window as time progresses that is narrow down. And uh, how uh, uh, large uh, uh, do, you, do you think it's useful to have uh, as a temporal context for acceleration? Yeah. It depends on the planet, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> is there a specific page where these um, the, the, the three you know, for programs are enough? It would be very useful to know, but I find it very difficult to find anything on yeah. the very yeah. website. Yeah. The way I do it, I just search uh, JWST, there's three programs. So I said GTL gives, gives you one page, you guarantee you have one page. Then there's the ERS page, and there's the general observance page. The ERS will be public straight away, GTL as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those three will give you and three different pages for the programs. Not helpful, I know. <laughs> yeah, rest of all. We're still going to start the ERS. So. And, I, yeah. and also, sometimes the schedule are, are fixed it, uh, very late. Yeah. We knew about some observations that were belong to our programs one week in advance or even a few days in advance. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, for, for, for you know, it was quite clear. We had some alerts, very little day, number 45 mm -hmm. is coming, and uh, that's the date. So, bringing the, the, the info. So, here we have, we, we would have to find a way of communicating the same way. Yeah, just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly for a year now, for a year from now, definitely keep going. Yeah, sure. Anything. Okay. But can I ask how ironic? Um, in, in those pictures, I mean, people have often remarked on this very bright glare that appears to be above the lens on the right hand side. Yeah. Would, uh, I, I've understood there's an extra layer, some of a thousand kilometers of the bottom. Your slide suggested it was uh, actually the true lens. 